All right, so, about six months ago, I started working overnight at Lowe's. Now, I really like this job. I get to listen to my podcasts and audiobooks, and the people I work with are pretty laid back. I work by myself for the most part, and most importantly, I hardly have to deal with the customers, and if you ever worked in retail, you know how important that really is. While I do enjoy working there, over the past six months, I've seen some really crazy things. It started off small and not really a lot. The first thing I saw, I thought it was just some kind of glitch. You see, in the lows I work at, there are two bathrooms set up for the employees in the back corners of the store. And when I first started working there, I didn't know what they were because they were just marked employees only. But I quickly found out, after I had walked the length of the store, that they were bathrooms. In these bathrooms, the lights work on a motion sensor. You know the types. Well, as I was walking past, I could see the light come on from under the door. I thought it was a bit weird because there were only two other people in the store and I knew where they were. I went up and knocked. There were no answers, so I opened it and it was completely empty. Like I said, it wasn't much, so I didn't really think about it. The next thing that happened was small as well. If you've ever been to Lowe's, you might have noticed some of the more expensive items having a green thing attached to them. We call them turtles, and those are our alarms. If someone tries to steal something with a turtle on them, once they go through the doors, they start letting out a high-pitched noise, which is pretty hard to ignore. So, I was stalking some caulking, listening to the Adam Carolla podcast when I started hearing an alarm go off. It confused me, so I went looking for it. It took a little bit, but I finally found where it was coming from. It was a drill that was sitting on the ground, and not right up front either. It was buried about four drills deep and under another display. As I was pulling the drills out to get to the one that had the turtle going off, another one next to me started going off too. I'll tell you that I nearly jumped out of my skin. I radioed my manager Mike and told him about it and he said that it's okay. Those things go off all the time. What was weird was at the exact same time Mike told me that, both turtles shut off. I chalked it up to coincidence and nothing more. Oh, how naive I was. Nothing else seemed to happen for about two weeks, and I'd put those instances long behind me. I mean, why wouldn't I? A faulty sensor and sensitive turtles. Sounded likely to me. I'm not... Correct Chin was not one to just jump to the supernatural explanation. To put it mildly, I wasn't a believer. Oh, sure, I wish there were some things that went bump in the night. I'm a longtime fan of Supernatural and shows like Ghost Hunters, and I always watch Josh Gates. Man, I wish I had that man's life. But I never experienced anything myself. That was until about a month after working at Lowe's. It had started just like any night. Went in around 7, clocked in, and started unloading the truck. It was about 9.30 by the time we were done, and everyone else had left the store, so it was just the night crew, the three of us. And for the most part, it was a pretty normal night. I was listening to a newly downloaded audiobook by Mark Tufo working on the third card by this time. It was close to about 2 a.m., and I was working my way down towards electrical to restock some fuses when I saw it. Honestly, I just kind of stood there more about a minute or two trying to make heads or tail on what I was seeing. Because a little bit over halfway down the aisle, there was an arm sticking out from under the shelving racks. It kept moving around as if someone was reaching under their couch to look for the lost remote. Once I got at least some of my wits back, I called Mike. Ah, uh, Mike, I said. Yeah, what's up? Mike called back. Ah, uh, Mike, I got a, um, an arm, I tried to say. Oh, that thing? 
Mike said, surprisingly unsurprised. Yeah, don't worry about it. Just don't get too close. It tends to get a bit grabby. It's fast, and its reach is farther than it looks. So just stay away from that aisle for now. I was actually flabbergasted at how lightly Mike was taking it. Uh, okay, I said, not really knowing what else to say. What aisle is it in, by the way? Mike asked. Aisle 13. All right, just steer clear of it for now. I'll explain more later on. What I've come to understand is that no one really knows anything about the arm. It shows up, and tries to grab things, and pull them under the shelving. That's about it. I've seen it about seven times now. Never in the same aisle either, and it never shows up at the same time. The only thing that seems to be constant is that it always goes back under the shelving just before 4 a.m. One time when I saw it, though, I chucked a can of spray paint at it. The moment that can hit the aisle floor, the arm shot out and snatched it and sucked it back under the shelving. And when I say it shot out, I mean it shot out. It must have reached three times the length of a normal arm and back under the shelving in less than a second. After I saw that, I followed Mike's suggestion and just avoided those aisles that it was in altogether until it went back under itself. That's all the time I got right now. I have a lot more stories if you want to hear them, like the thing that lives in the garden center and the naked little man I keep seeing. That one's a bit weirder than others. If you want me to tell you more, just let me know and I'll be back. Oh, wow. I never expected the kind of response that I've gotten. Thanks to everyone that wants to hear more of my stories, and I do have a bunch. First, let me address a few questions about the arm from my first post. Alright, the first thing. The arm looks like a man's arm. No sleeves or tattoos of any sort, though I can see that it has darkish hair in the forearm. I did notice one thing that seemed odd. It was missing its fingernail on its pinky finger. The second thing... Alright, come on guys, it's almost 2020. I've already tried to take a picture of the arm. I mean, how could I not? It's a random arm reaching out from under a shelving unit. Well, I've got some bad news for anyone wanting to see it. It doesn't photograph well, as in, not at all. Whenever I try to use my camera on my phone, nothing ever shows up. I tried to film it once, snatching something just like the spray can did. Son of a bitch just ignored it. That was until I stopped filming, and then it grabbed it. That really had me worried when it did that, because that means that whatever the arm is attached to can think. I told Mike about not being able to film the thing, and he wasn't surprised. He told me it doesn't show up on our security cameras either. The third thing. I kept pushing Mike on the arm, and he finally did tell me that, yeah... It did grab someone once. When I tried to get him to spill the beans on what happened, he just told me to make sure that it doesn't grab me. After that, he wouldn't say any more about it and told me to stop asking. I could tell that talking about it really was upsetting him, so I'm just going to leave it alone for a while. All right, I hope that helps some with their questions. I'll try to answer more when I can. With me working 10-hour shifts, I tend to only do two things, work and sleep. Because of my hours, I was curious about how much I'm walking now at work, so I downloaded a step counter on my phone. I can say I was a bit shocked to see that I'm walking about 8,000 steps a day. No wonder my feet always hurt. Anyway, no one's here to listen about my steps for the day. You guys want more stories, and they already hinted at two in my last post. So, I'll start with the thing that lives in the garden center. As anyone that has ever seen a Lowe's knows that they all have one. It's where they keep their mulch, stones, and pretty much anything you might need to plant or garden-wise. Right now it's filled with Christmas trees, big and small, as well as other Christmas-related plants. 
During the day, it's a pretty nice place and feels very... Christmassy. But at night, with the lights off, it can feel a bit spooky. No one in receiving likes to stock the garden center, so we take turns. Now the question arises, why don't we like to stock it? Well, you can look back to the aforementioned thing that lives in it. Someone from my last post suggested that it might be a garden gnome. And in all honesty, it might be. None of us has ever seen it. And from what Mike has told me, no one ever has. So how do we know it's there? Easy. We hear it and feel it. We hear it because the damn thing is always moving about. And we can hear it scampering on the roof, on top the racks, and in the ceiling scaffoldings. We can hear its feet slap the concrete as it runs through the aisles, always just out of view. Or you can see its movement just out of the corner of your eye. And that's not even the worst part about it. The damn thing is always laughing when you walk into the garden center. Now, I don't mean like a full belly laugh, or an evil maniacal laugh, but more like a snicker or a hush to giggle. You know the type. Where you know a joke or just something funny about someone, but you want to keep it quiet? Yeah, that kind of laugh. It starts up as soon as you walk through the doors and doesn't stop till you leave. And wherever you go, its laughter is always behind you or beside you. Sometimes it sounds like whatever it is is right behind you, and close enough that you should be able to feel its breath. But if you turn around, there's never anything there. Other times it sounds like it's coming from the other side of the garden center, and it's those times you have to look out for. Why, it's so far away. Yeah, it is. But that's when it chucks shit at you. Yeah, the little son of a bitch likes to throw rocks or rubber parts and whatever it can get his hands on and lobs it at you. Luckily, it's a pretty bad aim. But if it does hit you, then it really starts to giggle. Telling it to stop doesn't help either. It's like when a kid tries to tell a bully to stop picking on him. All it does is make the bully double down, and that's pretty much what happens with the thing in the garden center. The best we can do is just ignore it. Still, damn thing is unsettling as hell. The second thing I hinted at was the little naked man. Now this little mother fricker pisses me off to no end. As I'm thinking about it, maybe this is what the person said might be a garden gnome, but I don't really think so. First off, it's completely hairless. And by that, I mean a bowling ball has more hair than this thing. I've only really seen it a few times fully, and most of the time, I see its little fat ass running around the end of an aisle or scampering over the top of one, and it can move damn fast. I'll try to explain it so you can get a better understanding of it. The thing is only about a foot, maybe a foot and a half tall, completely hairless, and like I said before, fat and squat looking. Imagine a naked, hairless Danny DeVito without genitals, and you'd be spot on. Yeah, I said without genitals. Thank God for the small favors. The only reason I call it a man is because it has absolutely zero traits of a woman. We actually started calling it Danny once I pointed out the resemblance. Anyways, this little bastard is more of a nuisance than it is anything else. It likes to make messes, knock stuff off of the top racks, and steal your shit. That kind of stuff. It always makes your night a living hell because of all the extra work he forces us to do. Recently... While we were all taking our lunch break, we heard a lot of banging of a lot of stuff falling. We all ran to where we heard it. If you've ever been to Lowe's around Christmas, you know that we display those tacky-ass blow-up lawn ornaments on the top of the racks close to the entrance. Well, that little son of a bitch knocked one off. <laughs> but wait, there's more. See, we don't just sit them up there. We tie those things down so they can't fall on the customers. But this little shit had untied them all, then tied them together. So when we pushed one off, they all went. 
Let it be said, we were quite pissed off that night. Danny only comes out about two to three times a month, but I've lost about five box cutters to him. We have no idea where he came from or where he goes. He's not like the thing in the garden center, though. He doesn't laugh or giggle or even throw things. Danny is pretty quiet, except when it runs or climbs. His bare feet slap the concrete, and he always sounds out of breath, but only when he's on the move. Once he stops, he goes dead quiet. One time, the little bastard swiped my box cutter and took off. Luckily, I had just come out of the aisle to see him grab it. I took off after him, swearing if I catch him, I'm going to punt him like a fat, bald football. As I ran around the corner and had to stop fast, that pudgy bastard had set me up. Danny had dropped my cutter, but this aisle had the arm in it, and it was stretched disturbingly. So as it was trying to grab my cutter, which was literally just outside of its fingertips, if I hadn't come to a stop when I did, I would have been in, well, arm's reach of it. I looked up to see Danny looking down at me from the top of the rack. Oh yeah, I cussed him out. But all he did was watch me with those beady little eyes of his until he just ducked away and I heard him scamper off. I don't know if Danny was trying to hurt me or not, but I'm putting a chain on my next box cutter from now on and I don't think I'll be chasing him anymore. That's all I have time for tonight. I have more stories if you're still interested. Let me know, and maybe I'll tell you about the man that watches the store, or the fact that I think the store itself doesn't like me. Okay, okay guys, I'm back. And holy shit, this week. Boy, have I got a lot to tell you. But before I get into it, everyone seems to want to know about the man that watches the store or as someone else called him, The Watcher, which is what we started calling him just because it's fitting. I noticed The Watcher about a month ago. I was outside stalking the garden center, and yeah, you guessed it, that little bastard was running around giggling at me. Listen to part two. I tell you, I can't wait till summer when I can try to stalk the center before sunset, so I won't have to deal with it. Right now, I don't have much of a choice with the sun deciding that a good time to set is at 4 p.m. Well, my grandmother stays up later than the sun. I mean, yeah. It was made when we used candles and electricity was being used by Edison to electrocute elephants. But Christ, do we really need it now? Ugh, anyway. While I was outside, I was over by the register area. Putting away some large vases when I glanced out into the parking lot. It was there at the far edge of the lot, and just outside of the reach of the lights was a very tall and very large man. He was wearing what looked like a long, dark trench coat with a wide brim hat, and kind of like Reverend Kane's hat from Poltergeist 2. You know the guy. The only really creepy thing about that movie, except that this hat's brim was really wide, like almost out to his shoulders wide. The collar on the trench coat also was popped up, so his face was completely shrouded in darkness. And to say that I was just a little creeped out would be like saying Greta Thunberg only cares a little about the environment. I went to Mike about it, and back then he just sighed with frustration. Don't worry, it wasn't that me. He told me that this guy shows up every year around the end of September, beginning of November and just stands out there watching the store and tends to finally go away until the end of March. Mike told me that every night around 10 p.m. he'll show up somewhere just outside the property line, stand there all night, rain, sleet, snow, doesn't matter, and then he tends to disappear around 5 a.m. I asked him how many years he's been doing this, and Mike told me from the stories he's heard, and pretty much since the store first opened back in 2006. Has anyone ever tried to see what he wants? I asked Mike. Mike looked at me sadly. Yeah, he said. Mike told me that a few years ago, a young guy, one of those I ain't scared of shit types, 
decided to go and tell the creep off. He was never heard from again. And the cops were called, and a missing persons report was made, but the guy was never seen again. And the watcher disappeared for the rest of the year and the next. That was until November, when he once again showed up. I was like, fuck, Mike. Is there anything else that might pop up that I should know about that could, I don't know, cost me my life? At that point, Mike informed me that come springtime, I should be on the lookout of an incredibly attractive woman that starts showing up and tries to lure you out of the store to have sex with you. Yeah, you guessed it. She doesn't want to have sex with you, and I'm not supposed to believe anything she says or does, and that it's best to simply ignore her. I told Mike that if a hot girl was trying to have sex with me, then I would already not trust her, because that shit does not happen, and I mean ever. I haven't had a woman look at me like that for over 10 years, and I'm counting my wife in that. Alright, now let me tell you how my week went. The first really screwed up thing that happened was last Wednesday. Shit got real scary and real serious that night. Let me set it up here. I was working a unique shift on Wednesday due to Lowe's being closed for Thanksgiving. See, unlike other greedy big box stores, Lowe's actually cares about their employees. And as such, does not open late night on Thursday to sell items that have been marketed up, then marketed down, so that idiots feel that they need to get into fistfights over sheets. Oh yeah, I really saw that once on a Black Friday. Let me ask you something. Is there or was there any point in your life that you wanted to buy sheets at a falsely discounted price so bad that you would punch a complete stranger in the face? If your answer is anything other than, of course not, what do you think I am, then you really need to rethink your love for sheets. As I was saying, I was working the unique shift of 1pm to 12am. We were all supposed to be clocked out by midnight, and I was fine with that. And the majority of the night was pretty easy. I mean, besides having to deal with customers, but even they seemed to be alright for the most part. It wasn't until 11 that it went south. In the back of the store, we have our loading dock. And that's where we keep everything that we unload off of trucks that still needs to be placed on racks in the store. Or where special request items are stored until the customers can pick them up. Well... I was back there sweeping up and listening to the latest audiobook in this series called A Hard Luck Hank. This book was called Dumber Than Dead. It's really good if you ever get a chance to pick them up. But anywho, but anywho, it was really windy that night, due to the fact that we had a storm coming in from the east. The dock's roll-up doors were banging from the wind. They weren't really that loud, and I really had thought nothing of it. I was by the last of the three doors when there was an especially loud bang. So loud and unexpected that I actually jumped and dropped my broom. I didn't move for a moment, just trying to recover from the surprise. I went to grab my broom when the door banged again. There was another bang, but it came from the middle of the three doors. It was at this point that Mike came running back into the back. What was that? he asked. I just pointed at the doors a little too shook to say anything. Then came another bang, then another, louder and harder. I don't think that's the wind, I said. We can actually see dents starting to form from the numerous hits. It was so loud that we had to cover our ears as our other co-workers came to see what the commotion was. When they came in, Mike and I seemed to snap out of our shock and rushed out. Our co-workers quickly following. We went to the front of the store, but even from there we could hear the banging. Mike decided to call 911, and then he let us leave early. Needless to say, we all bolted. Mike stayed, but not in the store. He got in his car and waited at the road entrance to the store. On Friday night when I went back in, I found out that when the police showed up, Mike went with them to the back of the store to see if they could find what was making the banging noise. Well, whatever it was was long gone. 
but both doors were screwed up badly. So badly, they were going to need to be replaced. The managers talked to Mike and I about everything that happened, and I told them everything I knew. I asked them what the security cameras catch, and they said that they had knocked down just before the door was attacked. Yeah, I said attached because that's what it looked like. There were large dents and deep scratches all over the two doors. The third door was untouched because there was a trailer stock in it that we were going to unload on Friday. This now leads me to my last bit of weirdness. You see, while we were unloading the truck, we came across a small box with my name on it. Mike handed it to me but suggested that I shouldn't open it. When I asked him why, he said that everyone that works in receiving gets one of these sooner or later, and he was actually surprised that it took this long. I asked him if he ever got one, and he said that he did. What was in yours? I asked. The tooth, Mike answered. A mother frickin' tooth, he said. And he even said that it still had some blood and gum on it. And then I asked my two co-workers, John and Steve. I got a box full of roaches, and not the good kind, John said. I got, well, I'm not sure what it was said Steve. It was just a red, wet, squishy thing. I shook my box, but there was something definitely in there. When I asked where they came from, no one really knew. Mike suggested again that I just toss it, but after hearing everyone else's little prizes, I had to know. So with my cutter, I slit the tape and opened it. It was a dead bird. A chickadee, I think. John looked into the box. The hell? It, it moved, he said. He wasn't lying. I saw it too. Well, the chickadee didn't move. The poor thing was dead. But something inside of it did. I quickly closed the box, grabbed the closest tape, resealed it, and tossed it into the trash compactor, turning it on. So yeah, that was my week. And that's all I have time for now. And heading to bed so I can forget this week ever happened. And I'll keep telling you guys more stories of this crazy store if you want. And always remember, have a low safe day. <sighs> I don't know how much longer I'm going to last at Lowe's anymore. Someone said in the comments that it sounds like things might be escalating, and I think they might be right. I think things are starting to get out of hand. It started on Wednesday. It was my turn to stalk the garden center. I was out there stalking the mulch, and because according to Lowe's, there's no better time to work on your garden than in December in the Northeast. Prime weather. No lie. We get some crazy things in right now. Just the other day, we got two pallets of weed whackers. I mean, why? It wasn't even for Black Friday, but that isn't the point. I was out in the garden center, like I said, the stock and mulch, and trying to ignore the thing in the garden center laughing at me when it abruptly stops. I look up into the rafters as I hear it scamper up on over on top of the roof. Confused by the sudden change... I walked out into the open section of the center, and trying to see where it scampered off to, when I heard really heavy breathing. I looked over towards the sound to see the watcher standing on the other side of the fence. I stopped dead. I've never seen the watcher this close up, and apparently, I'm the only one who ever has. And apparently, the only one who ever has was never seen again. He's never approached the store before. But there he was, staring at me. I can tell he was staring at me, because while his face was still hidden in the shadows of his high collar and hat, I can see the gleaming off his cold, hateful eyes. Now, I don't scare easily. Spooked and unnerved, yeah. But scared? No. I will tell you what, though. While I was frozen where I stood looking at this tall tower of evil and evil is what this thing was, that if I hadn't already dropped a loaf earlier, then my pants would have been a bakery. Never before had I felt such a presence. 
I could feel my heart pounding so fast that I thought it would explode out of my chest. But at the same time, I felt as though my lungs refused to work, as if my breath wouldn't leave me as to not be in the same space as the watcher. Somehow I was able to get my foot to move as I took a slow step backwards. Then he moved. Not much, mind you. He just grabbed the fence, but it was fast. So fast that I didn't even see him do it. One moment his hand was next to him, and then bam, he had his fingers wrapped around the chain. The movement and noise made me nearly jump out of my shoes. I almost bolted right then and there, but his hand caught my attention and held it for a second more. At first I thought he was wearing gloves, but then I noticed the long gray fingernails. His skin matched his nails, except it was darker gray. I could also see that he was squeezing the fence. Let me just say that if anyone has ever driven by a Lowe's understands that there is a tall fence that enclosed the garden center and that it's made at a pretty sturdy chain link, I mean, yeah, you could cut it with a fence cutter, but that's what they're made for. Well, the watcher had his fingers through the chain link holes and as he was squeezing, he was bending the metal. I could actually hear the metal protesting against his strength. Well, as Biff Tannen said, I made like a tree and got out of there. I bolted for the entrance, closed the doors behind me and locked them. I called Mike and had him meet me in the back office. I told him what had happened. He said that he's never heard of the Watcher ever doing anything like that. Fuck, Mike said. He's never even set foot on the property that I know of. We left the door locked and closed till it was closer to six when Mike had to open the doors. He told me that he went to check out where I saw the watcher and said that he was gone, but he could see where he had twisted the fence up. The next thing to happen was on Friday night. It wasn't much, but somehow I think that it might be a lot more important than it seems. I was going to take my lunch break and I had stepped into the elevator. Now... I know that it's a pretty quick walk up the steps to the break room and offices, but my feet usually start to hurt around my break time and of course, I'm just lazy. I do take the stairs all the time though. I feel that it's a waste to take the elevator down the stairs because at least I have gravity on my side at that point. And plus, it's a lot faster to just run down a floor. But anyhow, I got onto the elevator and I was going to press the second floor button when I had to stop and stare. Where there was normally two buttons, there were now three. This new button wasn't marked, but I could tell that it was very old and very worn. Yeah, I have seen and read way too many horror movies in my life, but there was no way in the hell I was pressing that button. I pressed up and went on my break and tried to forget about it. The thing is... It always shows up now at least once a night. No one else has mentioned it, so I don't know if I'm the only one seeing it or if everyone else does, but they're just used to it. I asked Mike about it, and he had no idea what I was talking about. And neither did John or Steve. So for now, that's the nope button to fuck that floor. This next thing... <sighs> if I ever see this next thing again, I'm done. It happened while I was stocking electrical. Let me tell you, when it comes to stocking lows, there are four areas that are a complete and total bitch to stock. Tool world, hardware, lighting, and electrical. Each one of these areas have a shit ton, and I mean a shit ton of little items that are, half the time, not even in their correct place. Or they are, but it just hasn't been changed in the system, so you spend at least a third of the time just trying to locate a type of outlet, screw, or bulb, or some other little badge or box thing just to find out that they've been moved to an end cap or they're just a new item. It's a real pain in the ass. I was in electrical trying to locate some tiny fuses. I was getting frustrated because even though I was where the fuses were supposed to be, I couldn't find the one I was holding. So I decided to walk the aisles, 
and see if I might happen to come across them. As I walked to aisle 31, that's the main aisle that runs down the center of the floor, I saw a large, reddish-brown pool of something on the floor that wasn't there before. I also noticed that whatever made the pool had been dragged away and into the last lumber aisle, which also happens to be the last aisle of the store. Annoyed about it because I think that John or Steve might have been leaking something off a pallet and not realize it, I followed the smeared trail. I could not have been more wrong. As I turned the corner, I stopped. What I saw was not Steve or John. What I saw was a nightmare. At first, I couldn't make it out. It looked like a moving pile of wet clothes. There was a squishing sound that emanated from it every time it appeared to move an inch forward. At first, I couldn't make out what it was, but as it kept slithering forward, I finally grasped what I was seeing, and it was impossible. I took a step back and bumped a stack of blue buckets. You know the ones. We have them located at the end of almost every aisle. The five-gallon one. Anyway, I bumped a stack of those and they went down, causing a loud enough racket to wake the dead. I looked down at the buckets, then back at the thing. It had lifted its head and was looking at me. It was just what I was afraid it was. Someone's skin. Just fucking skin. No internal anything. It was flabby and squishy and twisted with reddish-brown liquid oozing out of its holes and from between its wrinkled folds. It had stopped moving, and its head was twisted around looking at me with its eyeless holes. Its mouth opened wide and more liquid flowed slowly out, and somehow it made a deep moan. I took a step back, and the thing came at me. Dear God, it was fast! Almost too fast as it just seemed to slither all over itself as it raced towards me. And to give you an idea of what it was like, imagine the 1980s version of the blob coming at you, except instead of it being a pink snotty thing, it was someone's skin. You better believe I beat feet getting the hell out of there. I think it was the first time I ever really screamed out of real fear. I ran as fast as I could, and let me tell you, for someone as big as I am, you'd be surprised at how the right motivation can really get you moving. I found Mike in the dock office with Steve and John. It took me a while to catch my breath and composure before I told them what happened. Lucky for me, they of course knew about the strange shit that's been happening at Lowe's longer than I have, but this was new even for them. I led them back to where I saw the skin. Mike was pissed about the wet mess. It was just more work we'd have to do to clean up. But when we reached that last aisle, they peeked around the corner and saw nothing. The skin thing was gone, but it left a trail. Not much of one, though. They could see where it turned around and came at me, but we can see where it stopped after I bolted, then the trail slid off to the side and literally ended at the base of the wall. It was like it just slipped through a cove joint, leaving a buildup of that weird liquid that was coming out of it. What's that? John asked when he saw something in the liquid. It looked like one of our name tags. Mike took out a pen and flipped it over to see the name. Trevor. Mike stood up fast when he saw that name. No, it, it can't be can't be what? Trevor, Mike explained, was the name of the man that the arm had grabbed. Well, fuck me, right? Like I said, I don't know how much longer I'm going to stick around here. When you almost shit yourself twice in the same week, it really makes you think about your life choices. I'm going to stick around for now, but I already told Mike that if I ever see self-moving skin again, I'm just going to walk out the doors and not look back. A person has to have limits, and I think I might be in mine. That's it for now. I'll keep you updated if anything new happens, or if I quit. And remember, 
and have a low, safe day. Sorry, sorry, yeah, I know, it's, it's been a while. Thanks for bearing with me. It's tough to write during the holiday seasons with having two kids, but I did promise people that I would write about the going-ons at my store, and after such a long time since I last wrote, a lot of shit has happened. Let me just start by saying that so far no one has died, so there's that at least. The crazy activity, though, has increased, and new things have been popping up. One of the creepiest newbies is the girl in the trash compactor. The first time I saw her, my heart almost stopped. It was the end of the day, or should I say night, considering it was five in the morning. I was throwing the trash away through the chute when I heard a soft sound. I couldn't make it out at first, but it was just too soft and then I heard it just a bit louder. It was a voice, a young girl's voice, and it was coming from the other side of the chute. Uh, hello? I said, with, let's say, a little bit of apprehension. And there was a rustling, and I can see some garbage moving around as a delicate, gray hand reached up and grabbed the other end of the chute, and then another gray hand appeared, in between them and the top, and a head started to rise. It had thin, dirty blonde hair with some kind of nasty wet all over it, and as the head rose higher, two dead, angry pale eyes peeked up over the edge of the chute's edge. I quickly closed and locked the chute. I try not to empty the trash anymore. Another new thing is the bird. Now, if you've been at Lowe's and there might have been a chance or two that you've seen a bird flying around. I really don't blame them, honestly. It's warm, there's many places to hide, there's free of predators, for the most part, and of course there's plenty of bird food. What we have, though, isn't really a bird, per se. I mean, we call it the bird, but it isn't really one. It can fly, it has wings, a beak and feathers, but it also has other things as well. It has these spider-like legs that it uses to climb along walls in the ceiling when it's not zooming around. I one time saw it spin a web in the corner of the store, and it caught another bird which it ate, and I wish to God I didn't see that. It caught the bird, jabbed it with its two long front legs, and his head split open showing multiple wiggling things which it inserted into the flapping little bird. I watched in horror as the bird seen to deflate and then melt. I had to turn away and swallow a verp. Now, you may not know what a verp is, but I damn near guarantee you that you've done it. Let me explain it. It's simply vomit plus burp, which equals verp. So yeah, after I saw that thing... I had to swallow it like a man, that little bit of partially digested nastiness. Not a good night. Then there was the night that the power went off. This caused me some undue nightmares. But, you might say, it's just a power outage. Anywhere else I'd agree with you, but have you ever been in a big box store during a power outage? It's creepy, like... It's almost an act against nature for those kinds of stores to be without power. Well, this, unlike anything else, is my lows. And of course, when the power went out, the strangeness started. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It was just before Christmas. And all through the lows. Not a customer was stirring. Not even the DIY hose. <laughs> Alright, seriously though. I was stalking over in plumbing. And I tell you, that plumbing can be just as annoying as tool world or electrical. Not all the time, but when you get a shipment of joints and connectors and you're going to be there for a few hours. And it's a good thing I had a new audiobook. As I was saying though, I was stocking plumbing and minding my own business when... BAM! Total darkness. And I mean total. I waved my hand in front of my face and nothing. My first thought was simply, fuck. Without hesitation, 
I pulled out my phone and switched on the light, and I was suddenly an outlast. My other phone, it's called a Zebra. It's our in-store phone that can be used to look up prices or locations and lets us call each other. Well, my Zebra went off and I answered it. It was staticky, which was weird considering when was the last time you heard static on a phone? Yeah, they cut out and break up, but static? Mine had static. I heard a voice, it sounded like Mike, but I couldn't make out what he was saying. Then my phone cut out. Well, at least the light still worked, thank God. I yelled out. Even though Lowe's is a big store, your voice can still carry pretty far. So I yelled, and no one answered. But I did hear something move a couple of miles over. Hey, I yelled as I headed towards the noise. Mike? Steve? John? I turned the corner and saw someone. They were on the edge of my light looking away from me. John? I asked. I thought it might be him. The person in front of me was wearing one of those blue Lowe's hats and a camo vest. In case you didn't know, Lowe's workers can wear two different types of vests. The classic red vest, which is for the average worker, and the camo vest, which I found out on the first day were for veterans. I thought that was pretty cool. I walked up and tapped his shoulder. Hey, John, what happened to the... The man turned around, and I jerked my hand back in terror. The man's face wasn't there. Instead, there was a fleshy tube or tentacle or cord coming out from the middle of his face. The tube ran down to the ground and off into the darkness. It twitched every now and then, and I could see it pulsing. The man reached out towards me as a muffled groan issued out from him. I turned to run and abruptly was knocked on my ass as I bumped right into something. As my ass hits the ground, all the lights come on, and John was sitting on his ass as well right in front of me. What the fuck, dude? John said confused. I jumped up and looked around. The tube man was gone. Where, where do you go? I yelled. Where do who go? John said as he stood up. When I mentioned the blackout, he had no idea what I was talking about. He told me that the lights hadn't even blinked, let alone went out, and that I just seemed to come out of nowhere, running right into him. I literally have no idea of what had just happened, but I don't want it to happen again. Some other updates. The thing in the garden center has been quiet lately, which has been nice, but I believe it's because the watcher is now always standing right outside the fence. Whatever the watcher is, it's so bad that it scares the thing. So I'm guessing that isn't such a good thing. Speaking about the Watcher, this son of a bitch scared the shit out of me the other day. I was outside stocking some vases. Now that Christmas is over, we're starting to get in a lot of the spring items, like wind chimes, planters, those kinds of things. Anyway, I was stocking the vases, which is located right against the fence. I was a bit nervous knowing how the watcher had been getting close, but when I checked, I saw him standing at the edge of the parking lot, and you know how big a Lowe's parking lot can be, so I knew that even if he started walking, I'd have at least a few minutes before he would be close, so I went to grab a box. I opened it and pulled out this blue-black ceramics vase. I looked at it for a moment, admiring the color. It was pretty. I turned around to put it on the shelf, and the watcher was right against the fence. I haven't screamed that high pitch since my balls dropped. I went from baritone to soprano in 0.6 seconds flat. The vase was also a loss, along with my dignity. And Danny's been really active as well, causing no end of mischief. Steve has been actively trying to hunt and kill him. Why? Let me tell you a little story. About four days ago, Steve set his phone down and walked away. Now, if you read my previous parts, then you know that's a bad idea. As you can guess, Danny swiped it. Steve even saw Danny take it. He told me that when he turned back into the aisle, Danny was holding the phone, actually flipped Steve off, and climbed up over the rack. 
Steve was cussing up a storm, and I'm sorry, I was laughing. I told him it was his own damn fault for leaving his phone lying around. Steve did find his phone later on, but it was cracked and actually smoking. And believe it or not, though, that's not even the worst part. Turns out, Steve was cheating on his girlfriend with, I kid you not, his ex-wife. And Danny had forwarded all of their texts to Steve's girlfriend. It wasn't pretty. Steve had no idea how Danny cracked into his phone. I guess that he didn't. He probably knew the password. Steve's phone wasn't one with a touch or face lock. It was just a simple code. And I figured that Danny had been watching us for a while. And since he likes to hang out on the top of the racks, he's probably seen all of us punch in our codes at one time or another. So that's something to really think about. So, now Steve is actively trying to hunt and kill Danny for ruining his life. As much as Danny annoys me, I don't believe it's his fault. Well, not entirely. I mean, it's not Danny's fault that Steve was cheating, and it's not Danny's fault that Steve was too stupid to not delete those texts. When I pointed this out to Steve, he just told me to shut up and stormed off. The arm hasn't been seen for a while, and I'm not too upset about it. I hate that creepy thing, and it can just stay away. But with things seemingly escalating, I'm sure we'll be seeing it again sooner than later. The new elevator button is showing up more. It's like it wants me to press it. Oh, I'm not even about to. With the way things are right now, who the hell knows where it would go? And as far as I'm concerned... I'm sure as hell not gonna find out. I think that's just about it for now. With the holidays over, I hope to write more. But something tells me that things are gonna come to a head soon. Mike told me that he's only seen the kind of activities that we're having now, only once before when he first started. When I asked him what happened the last time, he took his hat off and just shook his head. If, and I mean if... It comes to a head like last time. One or more of us might not make it out. But that's the extreme end. I'm sure it won't come to that. Damn it, Mike. Could you be more ominous? I swear, if it wasn't for the pay I make, I think that I should quit or transfer. But recently I found out that my wife works with a woman whose husband works at another Lowe's in the area and found out that I get paid a lot. And I mean a lot more than he does. This tells me that maybe someone in management, or maybe even higher up, might know what's going on here at night. And if that's true, why is it such a secret? And why does Day Shift seem to not believe us about what happens when we tell him? I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking it. But something just really seems off. Anyway, I'm out and heading to bed. Have a low, safe day. Well, hey there. I'm back. Well, our manager dropped in this week, and I must say, things got a bit... ominous. But before I go into that, let me tell you guys about some more weird shit that went down this week. It started out with the bathroom. I was in there doing... well, my business, surfing the net when I heard something. At first I thought I was just imagining it, but then I heard it again. It was a soft giggle. I, of course, finished up and pulled up my pants. I walked around the small bathroom trying to locate the giggle, and after a brief moment, I was able to locate that the sound was coming out of the drain. I got down and put my ear to it. I could hear the giggle better now. It sounded like a kid's giggle, specifically a little girl's giggle. I looked down the drain, but all I could see was blackness. I pulled out my phone, turned on its light, and I shined it down the drain. I saw something, but I couldn't quite make it out until it moved. An eye opened and looked up at me. Hi, it whispered. I very quickly no thank you out of that bathroom, and I don't care how friendly that drain eyeball seemed to be. I was not using that bathroom again. I just hope it can't travel through the drains. That's all I need. 
Now, remember back to my first post when I mentioned the devices we call turtles that we use for theft prevention? And how a couple of them went off for no reason? Well, about four days ago, around 3 a.m., every single one of them started chiming at exactly the same moment. And as they chimed, the music over the intercoms, top 40 shit, stopped playing and was replaced by a deep, croaking voice, speaking a language that none of us could even come close to understanding or even guessing what it was. I mean, it literally sounded completely inhuman. The turtles chimed and the voice spoke, for lack of a better term, for about a minute, and as quickly as they started, they all just stopped. Not much else happened for the rest of the night, but it definitely threw us off our groove. The next thing actually made me smile a bit when I saw it. I was working in plumbing, and you guys know how I feel about plumbing. Only thing worse is nails, nuts, and bolts. Well, I was putting away some PVC pipe and elbow joints when a box fell on me and nearly made me jump out of my shoes. I looked at it confused, then looked upwards. What I saw was something I didn't think I would ever see. Now, you know that bird I talked about last time? Well, it was going crazy. Squawking, flapping, and just making all kinds of noises due to the fact that Danny was trying to attack it. They were all over the place. They were like two WWE wrestlers back in the early 2000s, when the shit was actually good. The bird was swooping to try to bite or web Danny, while Danny would punch the ever-loving shit out of it whenever the bird got too close. Hey, Danny! I yelled. Danny stopped and looked down at me. I could see annoyance on his rotund little face. Get that son of a bitch! I said as I gave him a thumbs up. Danny promptly flipped me off and bolted after the rapidly escaping bird. Well, he might not like me, but I still hate the stupid bird more than Danny. At least Danny never sucked dry another bird. I think that I've come to like the little asshole, in fact. Yeah, he's a shitload of trouble and causes no end of mischief, but there was just something about the bald little bastard that I can't help but like. I don't know. I guess he grows on you, much like a fungus. He reminds me of a pug. You know what a pug is, right? Those little inbred abominations that are probably one of the ugliest, most useless dogs on the face of the earth? But it's those reasons that people love them. It's where the term... So ugly, it's cute comes from. Now that I think about it, they're so ugly, they actually become adorable. Animals are the only ones that term equates to. You'll never hear that term for a person or, hell, even a baby. And yeah, there are ugly babies out there. We all know it, and we've all seen them. Don't act like you haven't. There's always that couple that you know that if they breed they'd produce the human version of a pug. And then they actually do breed, and now you're forced to tell them that their little Sid the Sloth is just so adorable because you want to be a nice person and not hurt their feelings. But in your head, all you can think about is that you hope this kid develops one a hell of a personality. Could you actually imagine someone looking at an ugly baby and saying, Aw, he's so ugly that he's cute. I'll tell you one thing. I want to be there when that bomb drops, just so I can see the aftermath. Alright, enough rambling. The arm is back. Or should I say arms? And I mean those sons of bitches came back with a vengeance. It's gotten crazy in the aisles because just this week alone, at least 18 of them have been spotted and multiple ones at a time. John almost got grabbed by one. Well, he actually did get grabbed by one, but luckily it just grabbed his shoe which slipped off when the arm retracted back under the shelf. Almost gave John a heart attack, and I don't blame him. Mike said he's never seen anything like this. There's only been one, and only one ever showed up a few times a month. I can tell that Mike is getting nervous, and that man never gets nervous. He's been here longer than any of us have, and pretty much has seen it all. But the last few weeks, I've heard him say he's never seen anything like what's been happening more than I really care to count. And that makes me nervous. Alright, let me tell you about the district manager dropping by. It was the other day and I was over indoors, trying to put... 
well, doors away, and I'm trying to locate the correct place for them to go, which was proving incredibly difficult because some asshole during the day shift decided that it would be a great idea to switch around all the doors, but not the price stickers, so I couldn't find screw all, and it was really starting to piss me off when a call came over the intercom. It was Steve. Hey guys, he said. Can everyone come out to the garden center? Steve never gave an all call over the intercom like that, so I have to say I was a bit curious. I walked over to aisle 31, or the middle aisle, I should say, and headed over to the garden center. I bumped into John as he came out from lighting. What's going on? He asked me. What do you get when you cross an elephant with a rhino? I asked him. He looked up at me slightly confused. What? He asked. Elephino, I told him. Let's just see what he wants. As we approached the sliding doors, we could see Steve standing out on the open section of the garden center. Hey, John said. It's snowing. That it was, heavily too. We could see it accumulating as we watched. Mike walked up next to us. Is that lightning? That's when I noticed a few more things. Steve was looking straight up at the snowy night sky as what looked like green lightning lit up the garden center. How did I not notice that before? We slid the doors open and walked out. As we approached Steve, all of our eyes looked up and we all came to a stop. Dear God, whispered John in horrified awe. Above us, there was a blizzard roaring unlike anything we've ever seen before. The clouds lit up with dark, green lightning, but that really wasn't anything compared to what else there was. Silhouetted within the clouds of the storm, showed us only when the lightning flashed. There was something large. No, not large. That's not the right word for it. It was something enormous. So big that it filled every inch of the cloud and lightning-covered sky. It looked like long, slow-moving cords or tentacles, covering from horizon to horizon. Oh, and when I say roaring before, I meant it. The sky was literally roaring. John, I said, call your wife, see if she can see this. John pulled out his phone and called her. I knew that she was a night owl, and we had a good chance that she might still be up. I, myself, took out my own phone and pointed up towards the sky to see if I can get a video of this madness that we were witnessing, and of course, all I could see on my camera was falling snow. John hangs up his phone. Well? asked Steve. She can't see a damn thing, John said as he tucked his phone back into his pocket. Crikey, that can't be good, someone else said. We all jumped a foot at the new voice behind us. We spun around to see Todd, our manager looking up with his hands behind his back. Todd, when did you get here? Mike said. And Todd looked away from the sky into Mike. Just now? Can I speak to you, Mike? Of course, Mike said. Todd turned to us. All right, everyone. I know it's weird, but I need everyone to get back to their jobs for now. But... I said, pointing up. The, the sky monster. Yeah, yeah, Todd said, waving me away. I'm well aware. Just please go back to what you were doing. I'll talk to you all in a moment. We all looked up once, then started in. Wait, Todd said. Stay away from Tool World. There was something squishy over there. Well, I can give a guess at what or who that was. So we all headed in, and I went back to try to finish doors. It wasn't very long, though, before Todd showed up. Can I speak to you? You know, I just realized that in all my post, I never told you guys my name. It's probably for the best, to be honest. So I'll use Trent for now. Can I speak to you, Trent? Todd asked. I pulled my gloves off. Sure. You've seen it, haven't you? You gotta narrow that down a bit, boss man. The button. 
Oh, yeah, I've seen it. And you haven't pressed it? Why would I? Eh, curiosity? I ain't that curious. Todd sighs and rubs the bridge of his nose. Listen, the store has chosen you. Chosen me. Yeah, and you need to press the button. Why? Because if you don't, then things are going to keep escalating until... Until what? Until they don't stop, and then it'll be too late. Too late for what? Todd just looks at me with a sad face. That's up to you. Press the button, Trent, and do the right thing. Todd turns and walks away. What the actual hell, Todd? Do the right thing? Last I checked, this wasn't a Spike Lee joint. What am I supposed to do with that? The store has chosen me? For what? Why? W why me? Alright. This job has just gotten a lot worse and a whole lot more intense. I have absolutely no idea what I should do. If anyone has any suggestions, I'm more than open and willing to hear them. And so I guess until I can figure that stuff out... Everyone try to have a low, safe day. All right, first, just let me say that I'm writing this from the hospital. I'm okay for the most part, though I can't say the same for everyone. But before I get to the end, let me start from the beginning. The day it really went sideways started out like any other day, really. I showed up at nine, put my lunch away, and grabbed a Mountain Dew. Sugar-free Mountain Dew, that is. God, I'm grateful for that. I need to cut back on my sugar intake. But I hate, and I mean hate, Diet Mountain Dew. Shit tastes like ass. But this new sugar-free Mountain Dew tastes only just a little bit off. Kind of like Mountain Lightning from Walmart. Anyway... I grabbed my dew and headed for the dock to see what's going on. The night was running normally. I was told to take care of the electrical today and had only three pallets. Not really that bad, to be honest. It looked like most of it was fans and lamps, but there was one pallet that had a shitload of little things on it. You know, things like switches and plugs and whatnot. Anyway, I had just got done separating the pallets into aisle locations when I noticed it was getting close to midnight, and that means I was getting close to my first break. So I left my items where they were, in neat little piles all over the floor, and headed to the dock to grab my charger. I started listening to a whole bunch of new podcasts, and I like to keep my phone as charged as I can, but since I use wire headphones, I really couldn't charge it while I listen. I used to have Bluetooth headphones, but I ran them over with my car, really pissed me off when I found it the next day. Just a shitload of tiny little pieces all over the road. I know we sell these pocket chargers that use batteries. They're pretty damn cool, to be honest, and I've been meaning to buy one for a while. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So I charge my phone for the half hour that I take my lunch, and the half hour for my second break, which gets my phone just enough charge to last until 6am when I get done. Well, I had just got into the dock. Mike was on the narrow aisle reach truck that everyone called the Star Wars. When I asked why they called it that, he told me that it's because it looks like something in Star Wars that someone rode. Now, with me being the dork that I totally am, I was confused. I've watched those movies a hundred times, and I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. Maybe someone made a joke once about, may the forks be with you? Hell, I don't know. But I said hey to him, and went to the office, and grabbed the charger that I used when all hell broke loose. The entire building felt like it bucked like a wild pony trying to kick off a rider. Power went out. The emergency lights blared to life. The things went flying off the top racks. Shit fell over everywhere. I was knocked to the ground, and I heard a loud crash and Mike screamed. I got up and checked myself quickly. I, fortuitously, was fine. 
I ran out of the office and yelled out, Mike! Uh, over here, Mike replied. I went over to him to find that the Star Wars was tipped over, and Mike was buried under it and it looked like a couple of refrigerators that we had stored on the higher shelves as well. Luckily for him, though, the tipped over forklift protected him from the heavy appliances. Are you okay? I asked him. He tugged at his foot. I think I'm fine, but my foot is stuck. Was that an earthquake? Mike looked at me and slowly shook his head. I'm afraid not, he said sadly. It's time. Time? For you to decide. Decide? D decide what? There was a loud bang. It made us both duck in alarm as something smashed into the dock roll door. We both looked over at the large claw-like nail that had pierced through the roll door as something on the other side of it continued to bang on it trying to pry it open. It was the thing from the windstorm. Mike turned to me quickly and yelled over the noise. You gotta decide what's important to you. You have to press the button and make the choice. But, I said frozen, everything, everyone is at stake. You have to run. The sound of metal scraping and peeling hits us as other claws started to pierce the roll door. Run, Mike yelled one last time. I was off. Press the button, I heard Mike yell after me as I ran out of the dock. I turned and ran down the right wall, and as I passed the aisles, I can see in the dim lights what looked like hundreds of arms reaching out from everywhere. They came out no longer from just the bottom shelf of the rack, but from every shelf in every rack. Within some of those aisles, I can see that they had a hold of something. I at first thought that they had John or Steve, but then I noticed that those bodies had those cord things coming out of their faces. It was just like that thing I saw during the power outage close to Christmas, and the arms were ripping them apart. I tried not to look at the gory messes as I ran past, but I could hear it. The wet ripping, and the squishy plops, and the hard snapping. Dear God, as if I didn't already have enough nightmare fuel in the tank. I ran up to aisle 31, our middle aisle, and it was clear of arms. I had just taken my first steps to run when the garden center's doors exploded. I ducked, almost falling in shock. I looked behind me as the watcher stepped into the store. His eyes focused down on me as he reached out towards me. I was frozen to the spot. I had to move. I had to run but my fucking feet weren't listening. Son of a bitch! Hey, asshole! Both the watcher and I turned our heads to see John run up and smash a 10-pound sledgehammer into the head of the watcher. The watcher spun and fell to one knee, dazed. John looked at me. Go! Oh, I got big bad here! You sure? I said with more shake in my voice than I cared to admit. The watcher started to stand, but John roared and overhead slammed the sledge into the watcher's back, sending him to the floor. John winked. This old marine's got your back, son. I nodded and took off down the aisle. I reached aisle one and had to skid to a stop when the unthinkable happens. The roof over by cabinets groaned and buckled as a large... Fat, segmented tentacle bathed in dark green light, broke through and smashed into the ground, shattering all of the displays, sending rubble and wood chunks everywhere. This wasn't even the whole damn tentacle. This was just part of it, like some weird bendy elbow. Hey! I looked up aisle one to see Steve waving at me. Get your ass over here! He screamed. Well, I listened and bolted towards him. We, we have to, 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 to get out of here. G g get some help. I whizzed at him, trying to catch my breath. Can't, he said as he threw his thumb over his shoulders towards the doors. Doors won't open. Besides, 
I don't think there's anything out there. I looked behind him and out the doors. He was right. The doors were seamless, but it didn't matter because through the doors all I saw was the dark green light and enormous shadows. Fuck, I hissed annoyed. What? Steve asked. I stood and ran to the elevator. Steve followed me. What are you doing? Steve asked. I pressed the elevator's call button. <sighs> what I fucking have to, it seems. The door slid open, and I stepped inside. Steve followed me. Y you don't have to, I said to him as I put my finger on the old worn button. There came another loud crash as another part of the roof, I think over by lumber, collapsed. I'm not staying out here, he said. I shrugged and pressed the button. The elevator doors closed. There was a moment of nothing happening, and then a jolt as we started to descend. What do, what do you think is down here? Steve asked nervously. What do you get when you cross an elephant with a rhino? I asked him. He looked at me as a thin smile came to his lips. <laughs> Fuck you. He laughed. That brought a smile to my own, and then the doors opened. A hallway stood before us, a hallway made of old cinder blocks and rusty industrial lights that seemed to work only part of the time, or whenever the hell they feel like it. Come on, I don't think we have a lot of time. We took off down the hallway at a jog. Luckily, we didn't have to go far when the hallway opened up to a gigantic space. It was so large that we couldn't see the top nor the sides, and the only reason we could see anything was because, about 30 yards ahead of us, was a large open pit that dark green light and smoke issued out of. On the other side of the pit was a statue that stood easily 50 feet tall, give or take a foot. I really couldn't make out what the statue was supposed to look like, because I actually couldn't look at it. Every time I tried to, my head hurt, like it was on fire and my eyes burned and teared up. It was almost as if the thing was so alien to our world that my brain couldn't comprehend what it was. The only thing I could tell was that it was big and it looked like it was moving. What's wrong with that thing? Steve asked. I don't know, but I think we have to get closer. Why? Steve asked, horrified. I didn't answer him this time. Instead, I kept my eyes away from the statue and jogged up to the pit. I stopped at the edge and looked over. It was like looking into... Well... I honestly can't explain it. It was beyond anything of our world or imagination, and what I saw down that godforsaken hole was so twisted and vile and foreign that it made me spin away and I vomited. I can only pray that my mind will one day erase that trauma, and because if it doesn't, then my nightmares just became night terrors. Steve looked at me, both horrified and curious. He went to go look, but I grabbed his arm and shook my head. Don't, I told him as I stood up and wiped my face. Just don't. What are we supposed to do now? Steve asked, looking around the room, avoiding the statue in the pit. A voice suddenly boomed from all around us. The chosen one must choose. Jesus Christ! Steve yelled in surprise. Choose what? I yelled back into the dark. I have no idea what I'm supposed to choose. Look at me, boomed the voice. Oh, God, no. I didn't want to look, but I could feel my head being forced towards the statue. I tried to close my eyes, but it wasn't working. I fought it. I fought it with everything I could muster. But I knew that I was in a losing battle of wills with a thing that was older and maybe more powerful than God. My eyes were forced upon the grotesque statue and fire erupted in my head. It was as though someone took a hot soldering iron 
and slowly pushed it into my eye. I screamed as knowledge that no human was ever supposed to know was forced into my weak, mushy brain. It was only a second, but it seemed like forever, until the accursed thing let me go. I collapsed to the ground in a curled up fetal position. I'm not sure if I did or not, but I think I might have cried out for my mom. Steve came over to me and shook me gently. Trent, you okay? I slowly looked up at him. Jesus, you're bleeding from everywhere, he said. Turns out that being force-fed otherworldly damned information caused all the orifices in your head to spontaneously bleed. Who knew, right? I know. I, I know what I have to do. I, I know why the store chose me. I did, too. I finally understood why the store had picked me and what was going on. It was so strangely clear. I slowly started to stand up with Steve helping me. I know what I have to do, I told him as I stepped up towards the hole. I heard Steve sigh, but for some reason, it was tinged with sadness. <sighs> I had hoped that you wouldn't figure it out, he said. I turned around to him, confused. What do you... I stopped talking, because my attention was solely on the gun Steve was pointing at me. Steve? Steve shrugged. Sorry, I really did like you. And then he shot me. All right, all right, I'm sorry to leave you at such a cliffhanger, but my pain meds are starting to kick in, and I can barely keep my head up. I promise to finish writing what happened next time, but I gotta stop for now. Just, uh, if you're married, kiss your significant other, and if you have kids, uh, hug them, hold them tight, and tell them how much you love them. And as always, try to have a low, safe day. Alright, so I'm doing better. My wounds only hurt a little bit today. I'm out of the hospital and relaxing at home now. I'm spending most of my days playing video games or watching Netflix. Real excited about Lock and Key. I love the comic, so I've been binge-watching it. I also powered through, Is It Okay to Pick Up Girls in Dungeons? Loved that anime, by the way. I want to address something before I tell the last of my story. It seems that a lot of people don't believe me about what happened. And to be honest, I don't blame them or you, if you're one of them. I fully understand just how insane this all sounds, and if I was on the other end, I know for a fact that I sure as hell wouldn't believe it either. I wish to God that none of this happened. I hope every day that I'll wake up and it was all one big crazy dream. But I really don't think that'll be happening anytime soon. Now, as you can tell where I left off, Steve had shot me. But obviously, he didn't kill me. This isn't Sunset Boulevard. He got me in my shoulder. It spun me around like a record, baby, and I dropped. The pain was intense. It wasn't like in the movies or TV, where you could just walk it off. Oh, no. It burned like a white-hot motherfucking poker being pushed right through me. My whole arm went numb and useless. I honestly wish I could have passed out from the pain instead of having to feel it. I looked up at Steve with a, let's say more than a little confused look. Steve shrugged. Why? I had to ask. Because I can't let you do what you were planning on doing. I have to. If I, if I don't, everything will be destroyed. Yeah, I know. We're counting on it. All right, time for a little catch-up. When I was forced into looking at the statue, it showed me everything. A little more than I needed to know, if I'm honest. For example, are you ever alone in a room, and you get the weird feeling like something's watching you? Or you put something down only for it to disappear, then reappear later on? Well, just be grateful you don't know why that is. And no, I'm not telling you. It's bad enough that I'm forced to know. Wish I could have used the head key from lock and key 
and remove that horrid piece of information. That statue told me what's really going on. And this is where the real crazy starts. If you think my story was unbelievable before, then I'm really going to lose you now. Alright, here we go. And I'm letting you guys know that I seem to be losing most of what I was given. As if I was trying to hold water. So a lot of what I'm saying is pretty much paraphrasing. Now, a couple of millennia ago, an ancient, evil, vehement force was captured by a powerful, yeah, I know how this sounds, shamans, and trapped in a pocket realm to spend the rest of eternity. They placed great seals around the Earth at strategic locations that use the Earth's own energy. I think that some call them ley lines or something. As a generator to forever power the seals and keep the unnamed monstrosity trapped. Or that was the plan, at least. See, during World War II, a lot of the seals were cracked. Now, I got no proof, but I would bet my bottom dollar to donuts that the Nazis were involved with it. Near-apocalyptic disasters just kind of has their name written all over it. One of those now cracked seals just happened to be under the first loaves. When the seal cracked, one of the statues called out to Carl Buchan, a part owner of Lowe's at the time, and explained the situation. It turned out that the creators of the seal anticipated the possible cracking and created the statues as a backup, just in case. Well, it let Buchan know where the other seals were and which ones were cracked and could possibly break, and it was now up to him to secure and fix those that broke. And kind of a lot of pressure to put on one man's shoulders, to be sure. And with the statue's help and guidance, Buchan grew lows through the 50s, and placing all the new lows over other broken seals. After his heart attack in 61, his five-man executive team, all of them hand-picked, and knowing of the situation of the broken seals, continued Buchan's plans. The plan was working for the most part, but the problem was, Lowe's wasn't getting everywhere it needed to go. So after much debate, the five-man team decided to approach other growing companies and their CEOs to see if they could get them to help. And after showing them what was at stake, they actually got Sam Walton of Walmart and Ray Kroc of McDonald's on board with the plan. As capitalists, they had a strong interest in seeing that the world wasn't destroyed. It'd be bad for business and all that. And since 1941, there have been 14 cracked seals that have broken and then been resealed. The one under my store is number 15. That was why all that strange shit was always happening. With the cracked seal under the store, otherworldly madness was slipping through. And now with the seal completely broken... All the hell was pouring out of it and it was up to me to reseal it. But I had a limited amount of time to do that. How do I reseal it, you ask? Well, that's the choice part that everyone kept talking about. To reseal a broken seal, it takes one of the most powerful forces on Earth. A human soul that's given up freely. See, that's why I was chosen. I was the only one that had something real to lose. I could walk away and save myself, but in doing so, I would be dooming all of mankind, including my wife and two young kids. That was the choice, but for me it wasn't a choice at all. That was until Steve shot my ass. We've been waiting a long time for this, Steve said, and I can't let you seal the gate when we're this close. I looked at him confused. We? A slight smile spread across Steve's face. Why? A Home Depot, of course. A home... what? I said with even more confusion in my voice. The room rumbled. Times are running, Steve said. Long story short, a Home Depot was founded by a coven with the sole purpose of finding an open gate and keeping it open so our true God can come forth and cleanse the world of human infection. With you gone, the Chosen can't choose, and the gate will stay open. He leveled a gun at me. So, goodbye. 
I close my eyes waiting for the bang. They say you never hear the one that gets you. God, I hope that's true. But out of the blue was a bewildering, inhuman screech off towards the elevator. We both kind of stopped and looked over confused. What the hell? Steve asked. Like a naked, hairless little blur, Danny came running out of the hallway. Steve's face went from confused to seriously pissed off. You little son of a bitch! Steve said through his gritted teeth. He turned the gun from me towards Danny and opened fire. Danny zigged and zagged like a fat squat fly avoiding a swatter. He ran right up to Steve, and just as Steve's gun clicked empty, he jumped up, and Lord have mercy, bit down hard on Steve's crotch. Steve cried out in anguished pain. He dropped the gun and started punching his crotch trying to pry Denny off his twig and berries. I stood up and watched the crazy scene playing out in front of me. Then an idea came to me, and I prayed to God that it would work. And despite the pain from the hole in my shoulder, I took off towards the screaming Steve and ran straight into him, knocking him off balance. He stumbled back, spun his arms trying to maintain his balance, but I could tell he was on the losing edge of that battle. And then he let go of Steve's snozberries as Steve totters on the side of the abyss. I give this soul freely, I whispered as I ran up and pushed Steve one last time as he toppled and screamed as he fell over the edge and into the dark green hell. The whole cavern shook and rumbled as rocks from an unseen ceiling high above started to fall. I looked down at Danny. Elevator, I said as we both started running. Too bad I didn't make it there. I think a rock hit my head or something because there was a sharp pain from up above and I completely blacked out and when I woke up, I was lying in a hospital bed with my wife sitting in a chair watching the news. Uh, uh, hun? I asked weakly. My wife startled and jumped to my side. I asked her what happened and how I got here. She explained to me that while I was stalking something somehow, a toilet fell from its stored location and on my head, which caused me to dead fall on a pickaxe. I'm not sure where she got that story from, but I think it best if she keeps believing it. The rest of the day went by normally. I saw my kids and the rest of my family as they all swung by to say hi. And the doctors come by to check on me and see how I'm doing. My wife brought me a foot-long meatball from Subway Sandwich, my favorite overall. It was nice. When visiting time was over, I went ahead and sent my wife home with the kids so she could get a decent night's sleep and that's when I got two more visitors. I had just sat back and was getting comfortable when there was a knock on my door and two people came in. The first one was Todd, and the second one I knew I recognized, but couldn't put my finger on. Todd? I asked with surprise. Hey, mate, can we call me in? Uh, sure. Todd came in and motioned towards the man behind him. This is Mr. Marvin Ellison, the CEO of Lowe's. I snapped my fingers. I knew I recognized you from somewhere. He came over and shook my hand. Nice to meet you. We promised to make this quick. Is this about what happened? Yeah, Todd said. And everything that entails. You are a hero, there's no doubt about that, Ellison said. But... I led. But, continued Ellison, what we have here is something unprecedented. How? Well, mate, you're still here. Up until now, the seal has always been sealed by a self-sacrifice. You sealed it with just a sacrifice. With just a sacrifice. To be honest, I didn't know if it would work or not. Well, said Ellison, so far it seems to have. That's why I'm here. I wanted to thank you in person. And he reached into his suit and pulled out an envelope and handed it to me. 
We would love to have you back working for us, but we also fully understand if you want to seek other life choices. As long as things are kept under wraps, that is. Mr. Allison, who in the hell would believe me about anything that happened? Shit, I lived through it and don't really believe it. Mr. Ellison smiled and nodded. Todd shook my hand. Well, I hope to see you again, mate. We'll see, I said back. By the way, is Mike and John okay? Todd smiled. Everyone's fine. Even Danny. I smiled at that. Todd walked over and opened the door for Ellison. Mr. Ellison, I said just before he went through the door. He turned back to me. Yeah? Steve, I explained. He worked for Home Depot. I think they're out to get, well, everyone. I'm well aware, Ellison said to me. That's why I left them. Thank you for the info, though. He and Todd left and closed the door behind them. I opened the envelope and pulled out a very large check and a letter. And the letter thanked me and told me to enjoy my life. And with the check, I think that my family will do just that. So, that's my crazy-ass story. Sorry it took so long to get out. Life has been keeping me busy. I know how hard it is to believe, and I don't blame you if you don't. But thank you to everyone that followed this insane ride and worried about me and the others. And as always, remember to have a low safe day.